I'm curious today, uh, by the way, I'm Kurt, I don't know if I haven't met you. Hi, hello, welcome to church. Are we awake? There it is. Okay, okay, good, good. I was like ready to clap for Katie. I mean, come on now, you know. <laughs> I was like, ooh, it's silent. Uh-oh, okay. Well, in our hearts, we were clapping with you and to Jesus, so yes, yes, yes. Um, I am gonna just jump right in, and you'll see why in a moment, but I thought I'd start this by asking a question. Um, how many numbers do you have memorized? Can you think about it for a minute? Like, uh, your home number, maybe some of you, and I, I do, my, my phone number from childhood, I still have a couple of those memorized. Um, I have to have a social security number because I'm American, right? So I have that memorized. I don't quite have my, what's the one I have to have for work here? That one, uh-huh, yeah, SIN number, SIN. I, I, I don't understand, you know, I moved here and they're like, you need a SIN number. I think that'll make some sense later in today's talk. Um, so, so, yeah, there's just a lot of numbers. Now, it's interesting, PIN numbers. Uh, we're getting worse, probably, as a culture at actually memorizing numbers. And what I mean by that is we have cell phones. And so how many of the people that a generation ago you would have been inclined to call by memory from a rotary phone or even one of those old cordless phones, right? How many of those numbers are harder to remember now if you are a cell phone user? You have a database. You just press the name. You know, so, so it's interesting. Numbers are getting sort of different. They're, they're changing a little bit. But here's a number I bet we all have memorized. I'm going to put it on the screen, and you're going to experience the shock. Yes. Everyone has heard this number in some way, shape, or form, either because you counted that high, or because you've seen scary movies, or because you've heard of something from the Bible. Yeah? We're, we're actually in a series on seven churches in Revelation that we're starting today. And, and I wanted to just get some stuff out of the way. We're not going to do the whole book. So I'm just going to say that now. Um, we'll be mostly in chapters two and three, a little bit of chapter one. But what I, what I thought was like, ugh, this number just comes up and people are like, what's going on with the 666 thing? How do we know how to apply it, right? And, you know, it's, it's an under, understandable question. So I thought, you know what, we should at least talk about it. Can we talk about it for a minute? Yeah. So it's interesting because there's been predictions about who this 666 person would be. This idea of a person who has a number and this number marks people out who are unfaithful. Um, and, and so throughout history, we've had various predictions of either the end of the world, and it's always tied to who is going to be this antichrist figure. You, are you tracking so far? This shouldn't be foreign. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, yeah? So it's fascinating because we've had a lot of modern predictions in our time. For instance, in 1988, the uh, writer uh, Edgar Wisenot sold over 4 million copies of a book called 88 Reasons the Rapture Could Be in 1988. Hi, everyone. You're here. Fancy. Isn't that fancy? And he actually, there's a quote. He says, only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. And I say that to every preacher in town. So up until this went wrong, he was saying the Bible is going to be proved right because I have decoded it. 1989, after a failed rapture prediction, he wrote a book called The Final Shout, Rapture Report 1989. Now, I think it would have sold a little better. I'm thinking marketing-wise, number one, had he not had the one before. But, I mean, I kind of liked the title before. It should have really been called 89 Reasons the Rapture is going to happen in 1989. And, well, it sold significantly less copies, as you might imagine. It's interesting, even a book from the 70s by Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth, 
It predicted that the likely time of Christ's return would be 1988 as well, and that was connected to the establishment of Israel as a nation once again in 1948, that the timing just for these writers made sense. And yet, what we've seen over and over again, this doesn't seem to work well. Now, in the early 80s, some people were trying to figure out who could this Antichrist be, some thought that it was Ronald Reagan, the actor turned president, which is very interesting to me coming from the United States because I, growing up, most of my family thought he was a nice, genuine man. And, and it's so for some Christians, though, this is the guy. And here's what's really fascinating. I think I have a slide on Ronald Reagan. You can follow along with me here. Two things. Number one, in the book of Revelation, it talks about this figure, this 666 figure, being nearly fatally wounded but reemerging. And so Ronald Reagan had an assassination attempt against his life, and people thought, hmm, maybe there's something going on here. Others thought, hey, if you look at Ronald Wilson Reagan, each English word in his name has six letters, so therefore you get six six and six. How many of you think the writer John had English in mind when he wrote 666? <laughs> There's a lot I could be saying. I'm holding back, gang. I'm holding back. You see, here, here's the deal. He, he, it, it's fascinating because even Ronald Reagan like unknowingly maybe a little, but he, he played into the stereotype. After his two terms were up, he returned to California and he and his wife bought a home in, um, <laughs> they bought a home in Bel Air, which is where you live if you're the Fresh Prince or someone rich, right? And so he, he, he buys a home, but the address is 666 St. Cloud Road. So he has the government changed the address to 668. Woo! Close call, gang. It could have been him. Close call. Now, now he, he's playing into something, though, because there's actually a modern fear of this number, and, and rightfully so. If, if you've been brought up in an environment that was very much like apocalyptic, everything's going to H-E double and a hand stick, right? And you've got to get out of here. And, and here's, here's the official term for this. The fear of 666 looks like that. Hexakoisoi, hexakon ta ek phobia. I hope you don't have it, friends. But this is a literal fear of 666 that's been coined. And here's what's interesting. We even have, a while back, residents in Louisiana who petitioned their local government to change the prefix of their phone number from 666 to 749 because they did not want to be associated with the coming end of the world. Okay. So, so this, my friends, is just sort of the modern legacy of Revelation, the modern legacy of that number. And, and I think we can agree, at least many of us, that we've possibly seen this book of the Bible, that number and all the things in it, sort of over-sensationalized. Now, it's going to be an interesting day today. We are going to jump in, and, and, and friends, I'm going to apologize in advance. Here's what's happening. We have two goals today. Because the ultimate goal of this series is to really look at seven churches and the seven words that God gives to those churches, not like literal words, but the proclamation that God gives through John to those communities in the first century, and then to ask, how does what they were going with, going, what was going on there, how does that apply to our lives here? 
So we're, we're going to do that in this series, but it seems like a brief overview of the book of Revelation will just help us sort of be grounded in chapters 2 and 3. And so here's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to do a brief overview of the book of Revelation, and then we're going to discover in a church called Ephesus the, re- the real power of reviving lost love. But to get to the love, we've got to drink from a fire hose for a minute. Who's ready for fire hose in the face today? And when I say fire hose, gang, if this is an interesting topic, it is on YouTube. You can go back, you'll see all the notes, okay? How many of you are okay? I need lots of hands. Come on. Some of you are like, I'm not okay. I'm not putting my hand up. (laughs) Well, here we are. And I have a microphone. Let's do it, okay? All right. Let me take some of this water. So, Before I jump too far into the series, here's a few books that might be helpful. So at a general level, there's two books here, The Good News of Revelation, awesome intro, highly recommended. Um, And then N.T. Wright's little devotional commentary, Revelation for Everyone, super helpful for just orienting yourself into the book. If you want to go deep and sort of academic, reading Revelation responsibly is really, really, really good. And then Ben Witherington, Um, his commentary on Revelation, I just love. So those are a few resources that you can snag if you want to go a little deeper. They'll answer many of the questions you may have, at least from one angle. And and let me say that really quick, that um, when you step into a book like Revelation, there has been so many different people who have had so many different opinions about this book. People have used it to harm others. People have used it to sort of make it the center of their whole system of faith. And what I want to say as we step in is a couple of things. Number one, Revelation is one book that is part of a library of books called the Bible. And it is important, but it is not the center of how we orient our faith or theology. It is part of that. Does that make sense? And so when we think about the center of theology, we always start with the person of Jesus Christ, him alive, resurrected, defeated death, right? So we always start there and move our way out from there. And so I want to say that. And then the next thing I want to say is that for some of you, Revelation has brought fear into your life at various levels. I know this isn't true of everyone, but for some people I've talked to pastorally, I just know that when you bring up revelation, you either get the fascinated sort of, hey, this is an interesting thing, but I haven't really looked into it, and and it kind of causes division, so I don't want to really get into the mess there. Or you often get some people who grew up in an environment where it was the main Thing And every Sunday, they'd come to church, and there'd be some chart on the wall about this news event leading to this thing, to that thing, and then this sort of pent-up fear that you might not make it when Jesus comes back. And I just want to say, we're, we're not going there. And in fact, I don't, I don't believe that the book of Revelation was designed to cause utter fear or confusion. Last thing I want to say. Let's preface. I have my own particular view of Revelation. Is that okay? Can we just say that, right? Like, like, and you have room to disagree with my particular lens. You have room to wrestle. You have room to explore. There's four major views of Revelation, but within that, there's tons more, right? Lots of nuance is important. So what I say, I say as someone who has spent time there and does have sort of a a sense of what I think the book is about. But to be a person at Brentby, you don't have to agree with my particular slant on it. Does that make sense? Because what we're doing here, right, in any message I give, I hope you know this. I want to help start healthy, Holy Spirit-driven conversation. I'm not the end of that conversation. I start them, yeah? Yeah? Let's grow together. And let's go together because fire hose is here. You ready? Ah, yeah, 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 right. Okay. So what is Revelation? What is it? Three things you need to know right away. It is a letter 
In other words, it is literally addressed to a group of churches. This is no different than what Paul would do when he's writing to a church or group of churches. You following? So it is first and foremost a letter. Secondly, it is a prophecy. And, and in fact, the first word in Greek is right there, apocalypsis. And, and really, all that's doing is saying it is a revelation. It is revealing something that you need to see. Sometimes in a forth telling, actually more often as, here's what you need to know now from the perspective of the heavenly realm. And once in a while, here's what you need to know for the future. Thirdly, it's an apocalypse. Um, and apocalypse comes from that above word, and honestly, I should have bracketed that under the third one, because it's literally where we get the word. An apocalypse is, in fact, simply an unveiling. It's like the curtain is being pulled back, the curtain that separates heaven and earth metaphorically. You following? And in the first century, it was a Jewish form of resistance literature. John is stepping into a well-known genre of the time that is functioning for first century people in the Roman Empire a very particular way. Let's keep going. If I were to give you a mantra for how to understand this, this is what I would say. The last book of the Bible is a revelation of Jesus to John for the church against the empire during the first century with hope for the future. I'm going to say it one more time. I, this is good for memory. This just helps when you're coming to a book that's a little different. A revelation of Jesus to John for the church against the empire during the first century with hope for the future. Let's break it down a little bit here, and this is where we start. It is a revelation of Jesus. It starts like this. It says this in verse 1-1. One, one. We can hop to the next slide. It says, A revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So the author of this book, before anything else, wants you and I to know that this book reveals Jesus. It doesn't reveal doom and gloom as the primary focus. The focus is Jesus himself. If we lose focus of Jesus as we read Revelation, we might want to go back to verse 1 and start again. Let's go to the next little bit here because I think it's important that, that we just sort of track this. So it's a revelation of Jesus. It's a devotional experience that John is sharing with you and me. The author, Eugene Peterson, he translated the message and wrote billions of books and whatnot. Uh, his book on Revelation is really good too. It's called Reverse Thunder. And this is what he says about John and this experience of receiving this revelation. He says, St. John is a theologian whose entire mind is saturated with thoughts of God. He is God-intoxicated, God-possessed, God-articulate. The result of St. John's theological work is a poem. A poet uses words not to explain something, not to describe something, but to make something. Poet means maker. Poetry is not the language of objective explanation, but the language of imagination. It makes an image of reality in such a way as to invite our participation in it. This is an image-saturated book of the Bible, and we are invited to step into the imagery, to let it impact us, and to allow the power of the text to speak to our reality like it did in the first century. It's also a revelation to someone, to John. It's a revelation to John. And this is what it says uh, in the following verse. Christ made it known by sending it, the message, the revelation, through his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the witness of Jesus Christ, including all that John saw. Now, 
It begs a question, like, who is John and, and what's going on? Well, we need to sort of just frame this a little bit. Most scholars believe that John is writing sometime in the 90s of the, the first century. So it's the end of the first century. And John is possibly the Apostle John. He would be quite aged at that point, but it's possible. Um, he's for sure John a, a prophet. It says that explicitly about him in the book. That's honestly the only full piece of data we have from the book itself. But John seems to have been a Jewish follower of Jesus who when the temple was destroyed, possibly with the great migration that happened as a result in 70 AD, migrates with several other Jewish people, many of them followers of Jesus, into a region called Asia Minor. Today we call that region Turkey. And he's considered some sort of leader of several churches, seven that he names, and has been exiled to a place called Patmos, which we'll talk about in a moment. But John is this leader who has this experience devotionally with God, writes it down, and sends it out and says, you have a choice before you. You can be faithful or you can walk away from the best thing you've ever had. And John's going to challenge these churches over and over again to press in, to do hard things. And, you know, I think it applies to us. Like, I don't like doing hard things. Anyone here? Like, like naturally, like, doing something hard isn't my default. I have to decide I want to do something hard. I have to train to do something hard. I have to be disciplined to do something hard. And, and, and this is the invitation that John is giving to the readers of this letter. He's saying, look, world that you're in is hard. Following Jesus requires a radical commitment. But you can do it. You can do it. So let me talk to you about it. So the next thing is that Revelation is a revelation for the church. So it's a revelation of Jesus. That's the primary thing to John. John receives it, but it is for the church. In particular, it is for seven churches. So Revelation 1-4, we'll put it this way. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you, from the one who is and was and is coming. Then if we skip down to verse 9. I, John, your brother, who shares with you in the hardship, kingdom, and endurance that we have in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and my witness about Jesus. So something John has been doing locally has got him exiled to a small little island off the coast. John has been radically speaking truth to power. John has radically been embodying the values of Jesus of Nazareth in a world that has rejected him and he isn't going to stop. He continues here and he says in verse 10, I was in a spirit-inspired trance on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice that sounded like a trumpet. It said, write down on a scroll whatever you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I hear that the Philadelphian church has a pretty okay football team. Seattle's much better. Let's call it what it is. Although... CFL, baby. I've been to two already. Come on. Oh, yeah. I'm a fan. My kids have bells. They ring them loud. My Lydia wears her hat and screams at the top of her lungs. She doesn't know what's happening, but she screams anyway. So what's going on here? This is for the church, and I think it might be helpful to really understand what he's doing. He's writing down something that has application to the recipients. So many times we approach Revelation, and, and, and we forget how applicable it was to the people who read it. 
And, and so here's just a map to sort of orient us around what we're talking about. So here's Asia Minor, and you can see Patmos is this little island. It's about 37 miles off the coast. And the first church we'll talk about is Ephesus. And you can see that the letter sort of takes a geographical um, arc, even in how the different places are addressed. So Ephesus will be where we start. And he's been exiled because he's following Jesus. And here's, here's what's fascinating. We don't know what it was like on Patmos at the time, but some scholars believe that there were actually rock quarries on Patmos. And so these kind of criminals that weren't executed yet or were kind of on death row would be sent to a place like Patmos and would be working all day long quarrying rock. And so because he's following Jesus, he's having to do hard work. He's suffering. He probably has very little food, very little resources. But he has had a powerful experience with the Spirit of God. He has been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's been persecuted. So he's committed to faithfulness to Jesus and his heart as a father, like the heavenly father for the church, is just going to glow. And T. Wright puts it this way. Exile has given him time to pray, to reflect, and now to receive the most explosive vision of God's power and love. How many of us need space away from time to time to sit to reset, to, to find God in fresh ways. I mean, John was forced into this situation, right? But it's so true that when we create space to just be with Jesus, to be quiet and just listen, to read scripture, to pray, those are the moments where God shows up in a unique way. And God certainly did for John. Next one here. A revelation against the empire. I want to explain what I mean by this. Um, empire has two layers. It has a spiritual layer, and it has a quite physical, real layer to it. And we'll see both in a couple of passages here. Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, is the ruler of the kings of the earth. In case we didn't realize it, anything that is going to happen in this letter is going to be Jesus in charge of over, um, overpowering even the other kings that take hold of this earth. In fact, these kings loved to conquer during the first century. And there's several gods that would make up this sort of pantheon of imperial worship. What do I mean by that? That basically in the empire, wherever you were, you would worship particular deities to show your support to the Roman world and its regime. And here's a slide with just some of these examples. There's Pax, who's the god of peace. There's Nike. Yeah, no, it's real. <laughs> Nike, also in Latin called Victory or Victoria, the god of conquest, who had wings, by the way, and you see this on coins and every other kind of relic of her in the ancient world. And so Nike, when they were designing their shoes, have an abstract wing as their logo. Fascinating, right? Victory. You have Roma, who's the goddess who embodies all of the glory or so-called glory of the Roman Empire. And then the emperors have been worshipped since the time of Julius and specifically Caesar Augustus as gods, sometimes gods on the earth and definitely gods once they've died and elevated to the heavenly sphere in that system of thought. So they would conquer, and there's a quote there, we'll skip that, but they, they conquered in the name of these gods and they got people to comply with this by naming these gods as real and worthy of worship. And so if we keep going in Revelation, this is Revelation 16, it says this, then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come from the dragon's mouth. Okay, a lot of metaphor, just hang with me for a second. Uh, come out of the dragon's mouth, the beast's mouth, and the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits that do signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day 
of God the Almighty. What you have here is the interplay of three characters who represent things that happen on earth and things that are empowering said systems. The dragon is the representative, uh, is Satan in the book. You'll see this here. So dragon is Satan. In fact, right after the book of Revelation is written, we have actual evidence that when Roman military legions would march out to sort of inhabit a place, the standards they would bear, and this is literally 10 or so years after Revelation is written at least, would be that of a dragon slash snake creature called the Draco, right? And so it's so fascinating that the devil is referred to as a dragon or snake as well. Now there's a sea beast that we can talk about that at least at the first century level. Now, some scholars have a view, and maybe you grew up with this, that there is a first century reality in Revelation and a future reality. Um, I'm focusing just on the historical stuff here, and so there's some breathable space here. Just, again, not trying to, here's what it must be. You following? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but the sea beast, if you know any of this uh, from before in other readings of this book, uh, is the power of the emperor, and the earth beast, also called um, the false prophet, is the one who promotes the worship of the empire through those gods. And so, we continue on, and we start to look at something interesting from a few minutes ago. Revelation 13, 16 says this about the empire. It forces this person. It forces everyone, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the slaves, to have a mark put on their right hand or on their forehead. Anyone heard of this before? the mark of the one called the beast, whose number is 666, yeah, yeah, 17. It will not allow anyone to make purchase or sell anything unless the person has the mark with the beast's name or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who understands calculate the beast's number for it's a human being's number. Its number is 666. So we won't talk much about the mark of this beast, but you can imagine a first century scenario where unless either you have coinage that represents the gods of the empire, which some Christians likely thought was idolatrous to hold, or there was actually some sort of system where when you went to shop in the local market, you would actually go, it's called the Agora, and you would actually burn incense to the emperor. Or you would do something religious as an altar and show your allegiance to the whole of the system that you were about to step into to buy and sell. And this person has a number. What do we do about that? 666. Well, one thing we know, and you can go to the next slide here, is that in the ancient world, there's a common practice called gematria. Gematria is this idea that you can assign letters to numbers and come up with numbers. You following? So this is um, what you get, 666, when you take Caesar Nero in Greek and you transliterate it into Hebrew characters. And the writer of this letter is most certainly Jewish. We know that by the way the written language comes across in Revelation. And so you sort of take these letters and you end up with 666, which is Nero, Caesar Nero. And, and it's fascinating because there's many manuscripts, not most, but many, that actually have the wrong number, 616. Now these come from Latin and Latin sources. And what do you get when you do the same exact thing with the Latin version of Nero Caesar and you transliterate it through gematria like ancient Jewish people have done? You get 616. It's almost like they were correcting each other. 
So fascinating that both versions get you to Caesar Nero. And this is someone who, just before John's day, leading up to the destruction of the temple, had Christians killed, burned at the stake. He blamed Christians for the burning of Rome, fed them to lions, dragged them through the streets. And here we have Nero being referred to a couple decades after his death. And it begs the question, What's that all about? Well, there's a rumor about Nero that he never actually died. In fact, his funeral, ancient sources tell us, was not public like usual. It was private. And so rumors began from the day he was apparently killed that he was not actually dead. He was in hiding. If any of you under the age of 40 know about the rumors of Tupac, you have heard this. Yes. He's he's still alive, I'm told. So other legends came up and they would actually say, no, no, he's dead, but he's going to be revived again and he's going to punish Rome for the way it treated him when it killed him because he was assassinated. And Revelation seems to, at least at some level, know about the one who suffers a wound but comes back again in these rumors and things and seems to be playing into it poetically in such a way to talk about, like other ancient sources did, Domitian and the Roman system as a second Nero. We following? So again, This is the historical level. If there's a secondary level for future stuff, that's a debate to have, right? But at the historical level, this is the evidence. This is what they seem to be talking about. So the Roman Empire is powered by the dragon, the devil. And if you're a first century Christian, you have to decide how are you going to opt in and out of that system so that your kids can have groceries, so that you can be faithful to Jesus in the same breath. And my friends, it isn't easy. It's during the first century. We're going to speed through a couple of these because there's one big point I want to make. During the first century, Revelation 17 talks about, and I'm going to paraphrase some of this, but a, a great harlot who seduces the kings of the earth, right? So Jesus is in charge of the kings of the earth. So this great harlot has seduced them. And we're like, who's this harlot? Who is this prostitute, this metaphorical person? And as you get down into the next slide in the next part of the chapter. In verses five and six, we find out, oh, this harlot is called Babylon. Interesting, because Babylon's not Rome. Like, that's not the name of Rome, is it? And so this is the person who is causing all of this abomination, all of this stuff that is against God. And in fact, verse six will say that this person is drunk, as it says here, with the blood of God's holy people. And then, see that last little phrase? When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. John, for a moment, is taken aback by this figure in his vision. Like, oh. And the angel in the next verse actually has to snap him out of it. That's how seducing and luring this figure is. You keep going in the chapter, and it says this in verse 9. It says, this calls for a mind with wisdom, the seven heads. Now it's been describing this beast and a lot of stuff we won't get into, but it says, are seven hills on which the woman sit. And the woman, by the way, is a great city, the great city. What in the world is happening? Well, to root us back into the story of the first century and what these people would have been facing directly, here's what you got to know. We actually have a coin. Can you show it really quick? That is the goddess Roma sitting on seven hills. These are actually literal hills. They're the seven hills of Rome. And so we know that in the first century to say seven hills, you're saying Rome. And so Babylon is sort of an encoded way to talk about a very real reality. In fact, 
We might say that Babylon, this woman, Rome, and the goddess Roma, they're all kind of the same image, and they're all in cahoots with the dragon, the devil. And this, my friends, is what the book of Revelation will say over and over. Disciples must resist anything that looks like demonic empire, anything that captures our imagination. We must resist. Because, my friends, as we do so, even when it's hard, there is hope for the future. And this is what it says. The end of our fire hose, hopefully it's more like a spring. I'm reading from, by the way, the First Nations version of the Bible. We all know that we were thinking about our First Nations siblings uh, on Friday, so I thought I'd draw from this great translation. It says, Then I saw a new spirit world above and a new earth below, for the first spirit world, heaven, and the first earth had gone away, and the great waters of the sea were no longer there. I saw a new sacred village of peace, Jerusalem, coming down from the great spirit from God in the world above and dressed like, dressed in a wedding regalia, like a bride made ready for her husband. I heard a voice coming from the seat of honor. Behold, the voice said, the great spirit has pitched his sacred tent among human beings. They will be his people and creator himself will make his home among them and will be their God or great spirit. He will perform a wiping of tears ceremony. Anyone want to be in that ceremony? Please, Jesus. For death will be no more. There'll be no more sorrow or weeping or pain because these former things have faded away. When you are in a world saturated by evil and destruction, you need a hope that anchors you in the present so that together we can say, it's worth it. We can do this. We can do this. And the churches in the first century, they struggled to own that vision. I want to end by just making a couple of quick observations about one city, Ephesus. And then I'm going to close by just praying together. So Ephesus will be the first city that the apostle will mention. And there's a sky view of it there. You can see the auditorium. There's just a map again for reference. And Ephesus was a buzzing city. And so John writes his first sort of message directly to them. And he says, write this to the angel of the church of Ephesus, the overseer of the church of Ephesus. These are the words of the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your works in light of all of the system, in light of all of the hard stuff, in light of all of the brokenness, in light of all of the temptation to give in. I know how hard you've worked. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. I also know that you don't put up with those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles, but are not, and you have found them to be liars. You have made known endurance and put up with a lot for my name's sake, and you haven't gotten tired. But I have this against you. You have let go of the love you had at first. Let me say that one more time. You have let go of the love you had at first. You have let go of the love you had at first. So remember, the high point from which you have fallen. Change your hearts and lives and do the things you did at first. If you don't, I'm coming to you. I will move your lampstand from its place. If you don't, change your hearts and lives. But you have this in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans are doing, which I also hate. If you can hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I will allow those who emerge victorious 
to eat from the tree of life, which is in God's paradise. Friends, we struggle even today to hold on to the love that many of us experienced early on in our Christian lives. I was reflecting on this, like the, the Kurt who experienced radical transformation as a teenager and what that did for me was so special, so beautiful. It compelled me to just love people, to smile at people I walked by and just to be different. You see, Christianity is a lifelong journey with Jesus. And sometimes along the way, we get caught up in the world of ideas about God. We get caught up in the stress and the hard realities of living life in a place like this, in a place like ancient Ephesus where the gods were gonna be worshiped and they demanded the allegiance of the citizens. But I know this, that if you've had an encounter with Jesus, nothing, nothing compares. If you've had an encounter with Jesus and, and you say, you know, I miss the passion that was over here, the energy that was over here, the sense of God's closeness that was over here. God says it's never too late to return to that passion, to return to that love. In fact, that love has been there the whole time and make sure that you just discern that you're not so caught up in doing the stuff for God that you forget that it's God who wants to do the stuff in your heart and soul. One of the most beautiful invitations we have from God is to step forward and say, yes, I want that. Yes, I'm not going to give up on the pursuit of that love. And what I want to invite us to do this morning as we close, it's very simple. I want to invite us to stand together. Can you stand with me? I want us to just pray. And for me, when I pray in settings like this, it helps me to just open my hands and close my eyes and whatever posture is helpful for you. And I recognize that we're all coming at this from different places in our spiritual walk. But here's what I know. that the same spirit that spoke through John to these churches loves you and wants to speak to you right here, right now. That love, if it's passionate right now, that spirit wants to affirm you, bless you. If you want more of Jesus, more love, that spirit wants to talk to you, to meet you, to open you up. For some of us, this might feel sort of fuzzy and warm. And for others of us, it might just be a fresh sense of awareness of God's love. But can we together pause and receive from the Holy Spirit the life that God wants for us? in a world that's still saturated by evil, but that that evil has been overcome by good. So Jesus, we worship you. We trust you. We invite you to pull us towards love.